The title of this meeting uh, concerns two people, um, Lenin, uh, the leader of the Russian Revolution, the founder of the Bolshevik Party, and uh, George Lukash. And I just want to say a little bit about, um, about their central uh, achievements, the, t the two people mentioned in the title. And I suppose it's um, a, a, a commonplace to say that um, the extension, the uh, systemization, the um, reapplication on a wholly deeper and broader scale of the idea of a revolutionary party that was there in Marx and Engels is really the, uh, the greatest achievement of Lenin's uh, political career. George Lukács' achievement is that he took this experience, took this huge wealth of knowledge, this huge intellectual development of the idea of the, uh, of the Revolutionary Party from Lenin and systematised it and made it consistent with uh, the most politically and philosophically sophisticated interpretation of the classical Marxist tradition that anybody really has developed. And that combination um, of Lenin's development of the idea of the Revolutionary Party, which of course you know, is, is best, um, is best uh, taken directly from Lenin him, himself, but if you are to take it from Lenin uh, himself, you always have to read what Lenin wrote with a kind of historical commentary. So you can't read what is to be done and think you really know what Lenin was arguing without knowing the conditions under which he wrote it, the arguments that he was having, what his opponents were saying, what the historical conditions were. And that applies to any of the things uh, that Lenin wrote. It applies to the state and revolution, it applies to left-wing communism. They were always, and this was Lenin's brilliance, concrete interventions in a particular historical moment designed to win a critical argument. Always with a huge you know, framework of Marxist theory and historical analysis, and that was what gave them their particular force. But that's why, when you really want to learn about Lenin, you read from the books, but also you go to Cliff's biography of Lenin, or to Liebman's uh, account of Lenin, uh, Leninism under Lenin, or to Neil Harding's very powerful book on Lenin's political thought, which provide you with this as well. What Lukács does is to take out the generally applicable the kind of more universal elements of Lenin's thought to condense them and to present them in a philosophical and political framework uh, very, very powerfully derived from the whole uh, Marxist, uh, Marxist tradition. And he does this in, uh, three, um, in three absolutely marvellous pieces of work. He does it first of all, and most importantly of all, in a book called History and Class Consciousness, which is a series of collected essays written in the very early 1920s and published in 1923. He returns uh, to the question in the book that we're going to be discussing uh, mostly today, uh, Lenin, A Study in the Unity of His Thought, which was published uh, shortly after Lenin's death in 1924. And he defends the propositions developed in those two uh, works in a third book, which um, was, um, was never published in his lifetime. He, he, he wrote it, and it remained a secret until it was discovered in the archives, uh, in the Russian archives after, after 1989. It's, uh, his title for it was uh, Tailism and the Dialectic. Um, uh, in terms of accessibility, that I would say has its problems as a title. Um, when it was republished uh, uh, by Verso, uh, we chose uh, a defence of history and class consciousness because that's what it that's what it is. And um, as I say, that that work was unknown, undiscovered, unpublished until uh, a, a few a few years ago when we uh, when uh, Verso published it and I provided the introduction. It is a uh, it is a terrific defence of the positions that he develops in history and class consciousness and in the book on. Uh, in the book on, on Lenin. A few words about Lukács. Uh, he was already a prominent kind of European intellectual at the time of the First World War. The experience of, of the war um, made him into uh, an anti-war and anti-imperialist and the experience, he was a, a Hungarian, uh, in, the, in the enormous explosion of uh, revolutionary activity in the wake of the Russian Revolution and the German Revolution. He was part of the Hungarian, the short-lived Hungarian Soviet uh, Republic in 1919. Um, has this gone again? Um, he was, um, he was a, a, a leading 
a member of the newly formed uh, Communist Party. He was a, a commissar in the, hung in the, in the short-lived Hungarian uh, Red Army. Um, the Hungarian uh, Soviet experiment collapsed, really, uh, because there wasn't a Bolshevik organization like Lenin's Bolsheviks in, in Hungary. It formed almost... Um, almost at the same time, effectively, as the revolution uh, uh, was happening, and it wasn't a stable enough organisation to really be able to have roots and uh, a theoretical clarity and a, and a cadre which could guide the revolutionary experience. I mean, uh, perhaps one statistic will, will give you some sense of this. Uh, in, in a single day in, uh, in uh, 1919, 100,000 steel workers joined the Communist Party. Now... Um, <laughs> So I hope all those who are going to be recruiting at the end will <laughs> copy that technique and <laughs> see how well you can do. But uh, good, but difficult to integrate, you'd think, I think, in the middle of a, revo in, in the middle of a revolution. So that was, that was the experience, and it was, and it was a reflection both on, uh, on his own experience and the entirety of the revolutionary experience in Russia and Germany and the international revolutionary movement at that time that, uh, that forged these books and which in, infuses them um, with, this, uh, with this sort of enormous, enormous uh, clarity, I think. Um, so, okay, so um, let's, let, let's just talk about some of the key ideas in, in, the, little book, uh, in the little book on Lenin. And I suppose um, the, the informing idea, the sort of guiding idea, the idea that he returns to uh, in all the different uh, chapters in the, in the half a dozen chapters of the book is, uh, is what he calls the actuality the actuality of, uh, of a revolution and um, he develops this term really for um, uh, polemical purposes and the, the first the first uh, polemical purpose really is to distinguish the kind of Marxism that he wants to discuss and that he uh, argues that Lenin stood for from the uh, Marxism which dominated the uh, Second International, which would be the international which uh, Engels had been involved in. It was the international of mass social democratic uh, uh, parties up until the First World War. It was the international which had collapsed, uh, really, because its component parties, especially the huge... German SPD had uh, voted in favour of the war, its internationalism had evaporated under the, the chauvinistic impact uh, of the war on domestic politics in the combatant, uh, in the combatant countries, um, and it was a commonplace in the, in the revolutionary movement and in the third international founded by Lenin that the second international had become a reformist uh, political organisation committed to parliamentary gradualism, committed uh, to uh, a, a revolutionary perspective in war its only, but in practice and in deeds, had become a reformist organisation. And this gradualism, this kind of uh, suppression of the revolutionary element uh, in, in, in Marxism, was a dividing, the key dividing line uh, in the international movement at this time. And the point of uh, Lukács um, developing the idea that what Lenin stood for was the actuality of revolution was to say that um, it's difficult to maintain yourself as a revolutionary. It's difficult not to, in practice, if not also in theory uh, and in words, uh, become a reformist if you don't have some sense that a revolution is a uh, possibility in your era, that it, uh, that it is a, not just a simply a far-off goal, that it's not simply something that will happen one day at the end of a long experience, but that it is in some way present for you uh, in the struggles of the uh, of the uh, of the of the day, and um, he uses this as a, as a weapon against the idea of parliamentary gradualism, of reformism, and he uses it to underline the fact that what Lenin was doing when he was building a revolutionary organisation was preparing for a revolution. That it wasn't an organisation that was simply there to represent working class interests within the confines of capitalism. It was an organisation guided by the idea that it would have to perform uh, within its lifetime a revolutionary, uh, a revolutionary task. Now, there's been, there's been a lot of debate about this idea of actuality of revolution, and the most common objection raised against it is that it assumes or it, uh, it implies 
that Lukács and, if Lukács is right, Lenin um, thought uh, that this idea meant that the barricades were just about to be built. That tomorrow or next week or at the very latest next month there would be an insurrectionary movement and this was, the, uh, this was what was meant by the phrase the actuality of revolution. Now there are moments in the text where um, uh, Lukács uh, approaches this and it's not very surprising when you think about the conditions under which he was working. His experience was that revolution was a present a reality, that there was an insurrectionary move throughout Europe, and he wasn't wrong about, about this. There had been the Russian Revolution in 1917, there had been the German Revolution in 1918, there were the Piano Rosso, the two red years in, uh, in Italy. He'd lived himself through the Hungarian Revolution. Revolution was immediately a prospect at this time. But uh, Lukács was, whatever else you might want to say about him, not stupid. And it isn't this meaning which he really homes in on theoretically in the, in the book. And he repeats the point a number of times. I'll just, quote, I'll just quote one of them. He says, Marx nor Lenin ever thought of the actuality of proletarian revolution and its aims as being readily realizable at any given moment. The actuality of revolution provides the keynote for a whole epoch. In other words, what he's saying is that we have arrived at a certain era in the whole history of capitalism where both the possibility and the necessity of working class people solving the crisis in the system by revolutionary means is something which in this kind of historical time scale is on the agenda. Not readily realisable, as he says there, that's the word, not readily realisable at any given moment, not that we are necessarily in a revolutionary moment, that we talk about building the barricades, that Soviets are going to be formed tomorrow, but that in this era, the proletarian revolution is a possibility and a necessity if the society is to move forward. And at another place, uh, he puts it like this. He says that what it means is that it's the definition of an epoch because the bourgeoisie has ceased to be a revolutionary class. And he connects this notion of the actuality of proletarian revolution to the fact that the previous revolutionary class, the revolutionary class that had existed at least since the English Revolution and through to 1848, was no longer capable as a class of advancing the, the society. That he and Engels had participated, Marx and Engels had participated in the, in the, in the 1848 revolutions. They'd seen that at that point, the limit of poorly bourgeois revolution had been reached. And that from that moment on, if society was going to change in a progressive direction, it was going to be a proletarian revolution or not. In other words, he was he was addressing the idea of the actuality of revolution in the same way that Rosa Luxemburg um, addressed it when she talked about the alternative standing before society being socialism or barbarism. She didn't mean that socialism was achievable tomorrow, that socialist revolution would happen tomorrow. She meant that in this era, the contradictions of the system will mean either that the proletariat can make a revolution and carry the society forward, or it will be hurled, or it will be hurled uh, backwards. It will enter a destructive cycle, uh, if you if you like. So his point was to underline the fact that this is not uh, immediately available as a political task, but placed on the agenda as a historical necessity. We don't necessarily know the timing of the revolution. We don't know when these crises will will break out, but they are. Uh, inherent in the nature of the system, they exist as a possibility, and if we are to relate to them, then we have to begin the preparatory work. Even if they might be many years ahead, we have to begin the preparatory work of building a, re a core vanguard party, a revolutionary minority within the class now, because that is a pro that's a, 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 a prospect. And that brings me to um, uh, to the idea, really, that if you don't have some such notion as this. Um, and, uh, and Lukács makes this point, the alternatives available to you are either reformism, because if you don't believe that the revolution is an actual possibility pregnant in an era, well then, why not gradual change? That's the best that can be, uh, can be achieved. The only thing, really, that can be, uh, can be achieved. Or sectarian isolation, that you stick to your principles, but you don't believe that they have, will possibly in any kind of realistic timescale have any large-scale resonance in the working class, so you can adhere to those principles, but rather in the way that utopian socialists did. You are condemned to being a permanent uh, and small minority within the movement. So the point about the actuality of revolution 
is that it is both an armory against sectarianism and an armory uh, against re reformism. It is, the, it is the underlying notion of why the business of building a vanguard party, a revolutionary party, is a realistic as well as a desirable and necessary, uh, and necessary task. Um, and therefore, uh, when in the uh, second crucial chapter in the book, um, Lukács talks about, um, talks about a vanguard party, he's talking about an organisation which is neither a sect nor a mass reformist party, but which is attempting to have a real relationship between the organised minority of revolutionaries and the mass of workers in their day-to-day -day, day -day struggles. And it is this critical relationship of the organised minority to the real experience of struggles, of strikes, of demonstrations, of protests, of anti-war movements um, with, with which he is centrally, uh, with which he's centrally concerned to condense and convey uh, Lenin's, uh, Lenin's, uh, uh, Lenin's work. And here he has the notion of um, the party as being a kind of condensation of the past experience of the class. And he's concerned to override the notion that spontaneity in the struggle is enough. That, not that there aren't spontaneous struggles, of course there are. You know, nobody, Lenin least of all, predicted the outbreak of the, of, of the, of the Russian Revolution. Very few people perceive in advance the actual moment of explosion, the actual precise timing of events, the precise forces that will be involved, the exact character and slogans that will, that will develop. But having the sense that something like this is liable to happen, and what it might be, gives you the possibility to relate the minority of revolutionaries to the actual existing struggles as they, uh, as they, as they unfold. And um, if I can just uh, quote a little bit more uh, from, uh, from the book, he expresses it like this, he says, the masses can only learn through action. They can only become aware of their interests through struggle, a struggle whose socio-economic basis is constantly changing, and in which the conditions and weapons, therefore, also constantly change. The vanguard party of the proletariat can only fulfill its destiny in this conflict if it is always a step in front of the struggling masses to show them the way, but only one step in front so that it always remains the leader of their struggle. Now, that's a very, very important uh, dialectical notion taken from Lenin's experience, that the party condenses the previous historical experience of the class, seeks to bring it to bear on the struggles of the present. It can only do this if it's immersed in the struggles of the class, learns from the struggles of the class, but at the same point in time is one step ahead, but only one step ahead. Tony Cliff, the founder of the uh, SWP, used to say, um, a, a vanguard isn't a vanguard, if it's not in touch with the main army. If the vanguard becomes detached from the main army, it's just a bunch of idiots out in the woods. You can only be a vanguard party if you are in relationship to the main body of the, of the thing, and therefore the interrelationship between a consciously defined independent organization of revolutionaries who have a theoretical clarity, or hopefully have a theoretical clarity, who are capable of condensing the historical experience, is useless unless it's immersed in the day-to-day -day struggles, is one step forward uh, ahead of the struggles, but not so far ahead of the struggle that the mass of the people in the army can't see the vanguard. And that conception, very difficult to achieve in practice, very easy to make the error of being too far ahead or too far behind, but that model is the central question about how a revolutionary minority relates to the struggles uh, of the class. It doesn't as some people accuse both Lukács and Lenin of being, mean that the, the, the party supersedes the experience of, of the class. The fundamental experience, the origin of all this, can only come from the experience of workers in struggle. There is no other source for it. There's historical struggles, and you learn from those, or there's current struggles, and you learn from those, but they are all the struggles of the class, and the party's business is to condense and combine those two forms of, uh, of experience. Um, he makes this point, actually Lukács makes this point best, I think, in History and Class Consciousness, rather, in this book, and he quotes uh, a passage from Frederick Engels, which I've never seen quoted anywhere, uh, anywhere else, but it is an absolutely brilliant passage, and Lukács puts it to brilliant work. Uh, typically with, uh, with Engels, it's a, it's, a military, it's a military metaphor. He says, um, in, the course of the, in the course of battles, it's often the rank-and-file soldiers 
who invent the best new tactics under the sort of impact of, well, as you can imagine, saving your life, basically, you invent new tactics. He said the point of a good general staff is they realise when a new tactic has been invented and generalise it throughout the army. And that's the relationship between leadership and the invention, the capacity of the class in struggle to invent new strategy and new, uh, and new, uh, and new tactics. Um, so, um, I want that's the, the, the core, if you like, of, of, uh, of, of Lukács' account, and I think correctly, of Lenin's brilliance, that he was capable of combining those two elements. Independent, ideological clarity, organisational independence, but immersion in, learning from, at the same time that you attempt to lead the struggles of the class. And that, for me, is the core idea of what a revolutionary party uh, should be attempting, uh, attempting uh, to do. Um, I want to talk a little bit more, we're sort of beginning to move uh, through, but I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the other things that Lukács has to say. He has a section, um, not surprisingly given the era, um, he has a section on um, the world war, imperialism, world war and civil war, as he puts it. Now, the, the, the title is fantastic, of that chapter is fantastically interesting. Imperialism, world war and civil war. Because what he is combining there is the relationship between the conflict between nations, between imperialist war in a capitalist society, and the domestic politics of the class division, and ultimately, therefore, the most extreme form of class division, civil war, within inside those societies. And anybody who's you know, even had a passing experience of the anti-war movement knows that this is the critical question. How do you relate? In what ways do the conflict between nations, between the imperial powers and other powers in the system, how are they reflected and refracted in domestic politics, and how do revolutionaries position themselves in order that they can advance the interests of the working class internationally within side nations as they're divided one against another in a world, uh, in a world, uh, in a world system? And um, again, he returns to the idea that um, that our epoch, the capitalist epoch, is a, a period of the actuality of revolution. There's something different happening here than has happened in, in the past in this as well. He says, let me just quote, he says, um, continuing capitalist development created national movements among all the hitherto unhistoric nations of Europe. He's referring there to a phrase of Engels, by the way, who's referred to some nations as not kind of fully formed as nation, nation states or as national peoples, which was you know, a, a fair enough point when he wrote it. Uh, the difference is that their struggles for national liberation are now no longer merely struggles against their own feudalism and feudal absolutism, that is to say only implicitly progressive, for they are forced into a context of imperialist rivalry between the world powers. Their historical significance, their evaluation therefore, depends on what concrete part they play in this concrete whole. Now, this is a very, very important idea, and it's become more important in the years since Lukács wrote it. And I want to just refer for a moment uh, to uh, Iran. Because, you see, there is nothing about the Iranian regime, uh, the current Iranian regime, which makes it sort of inherently anti-imperialist. You know, if they thought that they could get a deal with American imperialism and world powers which was beneficial to them as a ruling class, they would do that deal tomorrow. So there is nothing in principle which is anti-imperialist about the Iranian regime. But for conjunctural reasons, that is because of certain historical developments, because of certain places that they find themselves in the current world order, they are opposed to imperialism, or perhaps a better way would put it is that imperialism is opposed to them. Now, this is a very important idea, and Lukács elsewhere in History and Class Consciousness, says, referring to the same idea, says, how can it be that a mass workers' party can at some times, and he's referring, of course, to the SPD in Germany, play an utterly irreactionary role in relationship to imperialism, i.e. backing the war, and a certain national movement, and here he was referring to the nationalist movement in Turkey, the Ataturk Rebellion, play a progressive role. And he says you can only understand this, you can only make a judgment of which forces at which times are going to play an anti-imperialist and progressive role, and which are not, are going to play a regressive role, by analysis of the totality. And the totality starts 
with the interests of the major imperial powers, how they go about pursuing it, how they divide their allies, who they find resist them, for cost and completely accidental, uh, accidental uh, reasons, and understanding that that alignment of forces is concrete and operational, and we have to act on it today, but tomorrow it may utterly reverse itself, and we may find ourselves with a completely different uh, constellation of, uh, of, of forces. Finally, I just want to talk a bit, a little bit about uh, some of the ideas that he also developed about the revolutionary process and the idea about how you assess the relationship between the revolutionaries and what tactics they should use. And I don't want to go into details, but he has a particular set of ideas here, um, drawn really from his sort of whole philosophical heritage, um, where he sees, and rightly I think, I think this is drawn directly from Marx and Engels, he sees social development and the struggles of the, of the class as being a process. You know, we, we are taught to look at things in static terms, you know, to look at things in terms of their formal definitions. You know, uh, you know anti-imperialism is this, this, and this. Reformism is that, that, and that. It has certain uh, characteristics. What he's pointing to there in that analysis about the conjunctural place of nations in the anti-imperialist thing, he applies to tactics as well. Life is not actually a series of static snapshots. It's a process. It's a developing process. It's, an, uh, it's a, in a process of constant change, of constant transformation, that you can't assume that what was true about a situation today will be true tomorrow or the next day, and probably wasn't true 10 years or 20 years ago. So you have to have this notion that the class contradictions in the society, the economic contradictions in the society, make it a dynamic, fluid, uh, process and the class struggle likewise is a dynamic fluid process that is constantly changing and a revolutionary party has to be able to in ju judge these changes engage with them and act upon them but he says and this is the really important point this process is not an evolutionary process you know <coughs> notions of evolution also have a view of constant change but they have them as or at least certain versions of them do um, Marxist evolutionists will, will tell you a story much nearer to the one I'm going to tell you. But standard evolutionary theory assumes a kind of even or, 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 or relatively even process of change. What Lukács says is that the process is always interrupted by moments, by certain decisive nodal points where certain forms of action are possible and necessary, and if you let them pass, they don't return again. And he cites Lenin on the eve of the Russian Revolution, where he's writing the letters from afar to the Bolshevik leadership and says, unless you take power now, unless you act now, the moment will pass. He says, a week may be too late. The alignment of forces, the specific correlation of forces, the crisis of the regime, the consistency of the revolutionary, the mood of the workers, the condition of the Soviets, either now or never. And he makes the same point, actually, Lenin makes the same point, and Lukács repeats it after the revolution, that there was a certain point where an alliance with other revolutionary and semi-revolutionary groups like the Socialist Revolutionaries, the Peasant Party, and the Mensheviks was possible. And Lenin writes, that moment may already have passed. In fact, I think perhaps it has passed. In other words, process and moment are two absolutely key questions. Certain things with a certain balance of forces, a certain relationship to reality, a certain action by a revolutionary party can change the course of future development. Missed, events will take a different course. A subjective moment, as he puts it, slots back into the objective course of events after it's taken place. Now, this is not just true of revolutions. Moments can be, they can be hours at an insurrection, uh, weeks, months, perhaps even years when certain things are possible, but they are limited periods of time. And unless a revolutionary organization can focus on what is necessary to do, to, as Lenin put it, and Lukács repeats it, seize the key link in the chain, with the link which, as Lenin puts it, determines the relationship of all the other links in the chain, grasp it single-mindedly, act upon it, it will miss its primary function, which is to intervene and lead the struggle such that there is a ascending, if you like, series of gains, or it's a possibility of an ascending series of gains. Some other forces may intervene, may be more powerful, may force regression, may force defeat, certainly. But within the limits of what is possible by a given revolutionary organization with a given membership at a given point of time, there is always something which should be done, 
can be done. If it isn't done, things will be worse than if it is done. And that really is the sort of overwhelmingly powerful message at the end of, uh, of, Lenin's, uh, of Lukács' view of Lenin. And I just want to quote finally, actually from Taylorism dialectic, what he says about this. He says, what is a moment? A situation whose duration may be longer or shorter, but which is distinguished from the process that leads up to it, in that the forces together become an essential for that process. The demands and demand that a decision be taken over the future direction of the process. That is to say, the tendencies reach a sort of zenith, and depending on how the situation concerned is handled, the process takes on a different direction after that moment. Development does not occur then as a continuous intensification in which the development is more favourable to the proletariat the day after tomorrow than it has been uh, today. It means that rather a particular point, at a particular point, the situation demands that a decision be taken and the day after tomorrow might be too late to make that decision. Now it isn't always a matter of hours or days, but it is always a matter of deciding at this time, in this place, with this kind of crisis, with this kind of balance of forces, how should we act? What should we do? What should we prioritise? And if we don't do it, then we've failed in the duty of actually leading workers in struggle. Yeah, I wanted to make two points. The first was about spontaneity, when people say, you know, Lenin argued against spontaneity. Isn't actually true in terms of his his views. I mean, very famously, he said in 1903 in What Is To Be Done that uh, socialist ideas have to be brought into the working class from outside because he believed that the uh, working class culture and, uh, and consciousness was, uh, was not spontaneously creating those kind of, uh, automatically creating those kind of ideas. And then, of course, in 1905, when the revolution took place in, in Russia and, uh, and what is now Poland, he, well, what was then Poland, but it uh, was controlled by Russia, um, he, uh, he said the working class is instinctively, spontaneously social democratic, by which he meant not social democratic as we might understand it, but revolutionary. In other words, that, that suddenly, when things do change, then working class people, quite independently of what socialists do, can develop ideas which challenge not just a very limited uh, ambit of their factory or, or their local area, but can begin to challenge the whole of society. And I think it's, it's very important we understand the relationship between these two, because the argument is not that people can't be spontaneous, and this is why it's so important that workers can be ahead of the party. You know, when people say people learn from the party, well, who teaches the teachers? So actually, the party has to learn all the time from the working class struggle and what working people do. And, uh, and it's, it's the combination, it's the constant interaction between the party and class, which actually allows not just consciousness to develop inside the working class movement, which allows the most conscious sections of workers to begin to come together in order to change things. And the point that's made about Lenin is that Lenin was absolutely I mean, people said Lenin had a nose for, you know, could smell the kind of the uh, the, the kind of uh, sense of change in consciousness. And one very good example is that in the July days in 1917, Lenin had to go into hiding, and he stayed with a family of workers in uh, in St. Petersburg, and uh, they served him some food and they served him white bread. And he said, "Oh, I see they're still giving you white bread and not black bread. This means that the ruling class are frightened to attack the workers too hard." Now, maybe this may be a slight paraphrase of what Lenin actually said, but the, the point he made was absolutely absolutely right. He understood that while the revolution had had to go underground for a bit, that actually this was an incredibly unstable situation that would, uh, would re-emerge. And I think that is very important for us. Now, I think the point about Lukács, see, I think Lukács is very much uh, blamed for having a kind of abstract view of consciousness. He didn't. I mean, why did he write a book about, um, about Lenin? Because he understood that, uh, that Lenin's concrete application of, uh, of revolutionary socialist ideas was exactly what was needed. And the point about all these people, if you look at him or Benjamin, all these people, they lived in a world where history was changing at an incredibly fast rate. I mean, these people lived through world war, revolution, um, failed revolution. They lived through all these kind of things. And what Lukács manages to do, now you can argue whether he does it successfully or not. I think he is being class consciousness, which I, when I first was given it to read when I was young, 
tongue a long time ago, I was saying to somebody before the meeting, it was like reading German. I could only understand every other word, you know, because there were so many difficult bits in it. But what he, well, when you persevere and get through it, um, that actually what you do find is that it does express in very, very clear theoretical terms exactly the relationship between the vanguard party and class consciousness. And I think it is therefore incredibly valuable to any revolutionary socialist operating in Britain today to give it, and to really to build on the politics of Lenin in order to understand not just how you go forward in terms of each particular struggle, but how you begin to make the connection between the different struggles and therefore generalise from them. I think it's very important that we do deal um, with the three works John talked about, the Lukács of the 1920s, as something discreet and separate from, um, from, from the rest of, the, uh, of his work. That there was actually a break, a very profound break at the end of the 1920s. And um, a clue to that being the right approach is the fact that Lukács himself in the 1930s denounced and dis uh, 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 you know, uh, separated himself off and, and, and wrote off the, the works that he wrote in the, in the 1920s. And I think that we have to take that on board. And what's interesting is about these works is that uh, subsequently they have been criticised by other Marxists and non-Marxists both for, bringing, uh, for, for, for attempting to bring um, class consciousness in from the outside, but this, this notion of imputed class consciousness from the outside, and also by other people as being kind of deterministic and fatalistic in terms of the sort of, uh, uh, he's been called a kind of ideological spontaneist. In other words, he's had criticism from both those angles. And I think the important thing about Lukács is that really uniquely at this philosophical level, he has been able to overcome, to understand a way of, uh, of uh, 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 describing the emergence of class consciousness in a way that avoids both of those dangers. And what he says basically is, first of all, the working class in capitalist society is in a unique position to be able to understand the way capitalism works because it is, as he puts it, a commodity with personality. It can understand, workers can understand commodification because they themselves are commodified actively and they have a personality and so they have to resist it and in the process of res resisting it, they begin to understand it. And when they understand their own commodification, actually that opens up the possibility of understanding the way in which capitalist society as a whole is commodified. Now, the, the other side of that, he says that on the one hand, on the other side, he on the other hand, he says that because of the um, sectional nature of struggles and resistance and so on and so forth, this is a process, this development understanding happens in an uneven way. Different sections of workers, minorities of workers understand this at different times. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, and therefore there's a massive unevenness. And it's that unevenness that actually is the reason why we can't rely on spontaneous struggles, because spontaneous struggles happen, but they won't happen with the force, with the unity that is necessary to overthrow the capitalist society and overthrow reification, and therefore you need organisation. And it seems to me that and the organisation actually comes out of the partial experience of the best minority of workers, but it then needs to be projected wider in order to create a unity that has the capacity, the fighting capacity, to uh, overthrow the system. And it seems to me that, uh, uh, in the way that John says, Lenin worked on those principles in many ways, but never theorised those principles. And actually, I think that Lukács has, in a uniquely useful way, brought together a philosophical understanding of the way in which class consciousness can develop into revolutionary consciousness in a way that no one else has. I do hope that, um, that, that I've engaged you um, as much as uh, you've engaged me during discussion. I thought it was an outstanding uh, discussion, and uh, it's, it's good to see that there are uh, so many people studying and taking Lukács uh, seriously, because, um, well, I, I, Lenin once said um, that um, no one could consider themselves genuinely a Marxist until they'd read and studied the whole of the works of Hegel, which is kind of lifting the bar a bit, but um, <laughs> it's um, reasonable, I think, to say that if at some point in your experience as a revolutionary, you don't um, read and absorb Lukács, uh, I don't think that you've got all that you can get in terms of being a, a revolutionary. And I want to answer some of the, the questions. The, the question of imputed consciousness, and the criticism is basically, um, as a number of, uh, of, uh, of contributors said, that the Revolutionary Party has this idea about what the consciousness of the working class should be, 
Uh, and even though the working class doesn't have this consciousness, it kind of imputes this idea to them, sort of, you know, sort of, in, kind of a mixture of kind of enforcing and attributing uh, this consciousness to them. Now, uh, this is a, it's, it's impossible to go through and summing up the number of levels at which this is rubbish, really, but just let me uh, indicate the critical one. The, the idea here is, if we put it in slightly different language, that the interests of the working class, their objective interests, as the language has it, and their consciousness, their subjective consciousness at any one time, is separate. And now lots of people who are anti-social say, oh, well, you know, that's just the socialists saying that we know better than the class, and even though the class you know, aren't socialists, we say they are really, and, you know, this is just a kind of, you know, magician's trick by the, by the socialists. But in actual fact, if you think about it, this difference between people's consciousness and their interests, we all use it every day in our lives. Everybody says, oh, you know, ooh, I don't know about so-and-so's girlfriend. You know, I, they may certainly love them, think they love this person, but, you know, I'm not so sure they aren't in for a shot down the road. You know, I, that you, they have an objective interest which they don't understand yet, and when their eyes wake up to this, it's bad news. People use this all the time. I mean, think about, think about smokers. Now, smokers have a false consciousness, there's no doubt about it. I mean, you think about it. You th think about it. You know, you, you, if you're a smoker, you can't miss it. You know, it says on the packets, there's those really hideous pictures. It says, you are going to die if you do this. <laughs> and it's not invented, it's true. So we pretty much all agree that their interest lies in not doing this. Objectively, their interest lies in not smoking. But hey, look at their false consciousness. They just carry on doing it anyway. So their consciousness and their interests are in two utterly different places. Now actually, we Marxists have an understanding of why that false consciousness arises. You know, the, the stresses, the, you know, of modern life, the difficulties, the socialing, social nature of smoking, the, you know, addictive element in it. We've got a an objective explanation of why their consciousness is different to their interests. Now, you know, hey, I don't smoke, so and I, I put a very forceful argument, alcohol is a completely different case. But, um, but, you know, we use this gap between people's consciousness and their interests all the time. And what Marx and Engels and Lukács are saying is this exists as a social structure that people are encouraged to have, because of their position in society, they start out with, certainly, a consciousness which is different to their interests. It is not in their interests, many workers have done it in the last few months, to take wage cuts. You know, that won't help. In the end of the day, it won't help. It might look like it helps. Maybe they're conscious, maybe reluctantly do it. It won't help in the end of the day. Their interests and their consciousness are different. And this is exactly what Lukács is referring to. And we don't have to guess about this, because in the little book that he wrote to defend history and class consciousness, he, he, was, he was criticised by Stalinists, by, by real Stalinists. Stalinists at the time, Rudas, who was a complete Stalinist hack in the Hungarian Communist Party in, in Emirates, made exactly this criticism of the question of imputation. And in this book, there's a whole section entitled Imputation. So we have no difficulty in knowing what he really thought about this. And he puts it like this. He says, the proletariat can have correct knowledge of the historical process and its individual stages in accordance with its class position. But does it always have this knowledge? No, not at all. And insomuch as this distance is acknowledged to be a fact, it is the duty of every Marxist to reflect seriously on its causes and, most importantly, the means of overcoming it. This question, the actual substance of my difference with Comrade Rudas in relation to imputate the imputation problem, by imputed class consciousness, I mean the consciousness that corresponds to the objective economic position of the proletariat at any one time and that can be attained by the proletariat. I use the expression imputation in order to represent this distance clearly. I repeat, while I am quite happy to let the expression go if it leads to misunderstandings, I am not prepared to budge one inch from the Bolshevik consideration of the class struggle in order to accommodate mechanistic, tailistic objections to the matter itself. 
Now, you can't get clearer than that, and I think he was absolutely right in what he said about that, uh, about that question. It doesn't imply externality. It, reply, it implies that the causes of a, the ways he puts it of overcoming it is that workers begin to overcome it in the process of class struggle, and that the party is there to accelerate, to clarify, to sharpen that process with them as they go, as they go through, the, through the struggle. And that's what he says in history and class consciousness and all time in the Lenin thing. Again, on the question of the, the break, you see, we don't have to, you know, there's a, I'm always, I, uh, I, my, the hair on the back of my neck always begins to prickle slightly when I hear the argument that the kind of, the seeds of a bad position in the future were always there in pre-existing. Now, if this was true about Stalinism, there'd be a lot of people we'd have to go back to and look at their earlier works. Gramsci, as well as Lukács. Bukharin, as well as Lukács. Are we really saying that in, because Bukharin became a Stalinist, that the seeds of this existed in, you know, the, his book on imperialism and the world, and the world economy? I don't think that's the sensible way to, to, to go about it. There was a huge transformation in the political environment in which they were operating, and many people from a variety of different political positions succumbed in one way or the other. In Lukács, we don't, Chris and I am absolutely right, we don't have to wonder because he wrote it down. He himself had to break from his own system in these three works in order to become a Stalinist. The book in which that transition takes place is a book called The Young Hegel, which in many ways is an admirable and interesting book, but it charts the break with his system as elaborated in history and class consciousness. So this you know, bit is a mystery, and we don't have to denigrate or believe that there was anything inherently Stalinist or a germ of Stalinism or a trace of Stalinism in the earlier works in order to explain it. He explains it himself, and it's there present as a sort of ideological break in some, in some, later, in some later works. Um, on the question of See, Lukács has never been fashionable in academia. Um, and, uh, you know, when I, when I came into politics in, in, in the 1970s and started studying these things, the huge academic fashion was for Louis Althusser, the sort of, which is the, the point of departure for all subsequent postmodernism and, and all the rest of it. And, of course, um, if, if I, I'm reaching back into old debates now here, but as I remember it, one of Althusser's aims was, he, as he said, to drive the spectre of Hegelian Marxism out of the tradition. Now, why this, why, why Althusser and some subsequent figures, that you why are they sort of absorbable by academia and Lukács is less absorbable by academia? It's because it's for the same reason that you don't get courses talking about Lenin and you don't get courses talking about Trotsky. Because it's too much there. It's too clear, it's too forceful, it's too Marxist, it's too materialist, it's too revolutionary, and they can't absorb it in the way that you can, to, into my mind, in, in thinkers that are uh, very much less interesting and certainly very much less systematically clear in their thought than, than, than Lukács is. Now, I'm sure there are other uh, explanations that could, could be added to that, but that is the fundamental, the fundamental issue. Um, for, uh, for, for, for me. Uh, I think the point that the comrade made from South Africa about is that is exactly one moment, and I, I wrote about this a little bit in the book on imperialism. There was a moment in South Africa where there could have either been the transition to a, a black capitalist democracy, which is what we got, and all the exploitation and continued poverty and the rule of the multinationals that has come with it, or there was the possibility of something different happening there. It was on a grand scale, one of those historical moments where something profound could have happened. And it didn't happen because there wasn't an organisation built on the principles and the way that Lenin talked about it that could have made that revolution turn out in the way that the Russian Revolution turned out, rather than the way that many revolutionary uh, experiences have turned out. And the way, you know, to just to finish on the question of how do you get history to kind of jump the rails like, like that? Well, I think the Benjamin thing is, you know, history, it, you know, the whole idea of sort of being blown out of its rut or, or, or blown off the rails, it, it's a kind of wrong metaphor, really, because it kind of assumes that it's running on rails. To, you know, there's a kind of predetermined course which it will follow. But the whole point about there being a process and moments is that there's not. There's certain processes, there are certain conditions, but there are also frequently, and at all sorts of different levels, moments of decision. That the same conditions, the same crisis, the same political crisis, the same economic crisis can have more than one outcome. And it depends how we act and what forces we have to act with that will determine whether the same, absolutely the same historical circumstance issues in defeat or victory. And that's the way I think that it's most sensible to look at it. And the Lindsay oil refinery thing is a very good 
microcosmic example of that. If you were undialectal, didn't see things as a process, simply studied the surface, didn't see that there's a difference between the false consciousness and the real interests of workers, what would you have said about the first strike? You would have only have seen British jobs for British workers. You would have distanced yourself from those people. You would have stood aside from their struggle. But just out of gut instinct for most people, but if you want to theorize it, what you would have said is, these people are moving into struggle with our intervention and their experience what is false in their consciousness now has the possibility, only the possibility, not the inevitability, but the possibility of being eradicated. And look what happens weeks later. These people have a strike in which they break every single union law on the statute book, where they do things that we haven't seen for 25 years, hands up, all out for a strike. They get solidarity from around the country. Interesting, I think this is an underanalyzed bit of it. The union officials, as they've done for decades, do not... It's the dog that didn't bark, like the Sherlock Holmes story, did not intervene to stop it, to stop it happening. And there has been a, a, a significant victory in a serious organised group of workers. The very same people, the very same people that were raising the British Jobs for British Workers slogan. Now that in my cousin, if you take the wrong decision, if you don't intervene in the right way, if you don't see the potentiality, if you don't see the gap between their existing consciousness and their potential imputed consciousness, you would have got that wrong. And that's the truth about any particular strike, any particular moment historically. You have to analyse it, see the objective relations, what's possible and what's not. But at the end of the day, there will be a moment of decision. We either do this, we have either have enough faith in our own analysis, enough faith in our own ability to act, enough faith in our own organisation to try it. Now, sometimes you get it wrong, and you get punished for getting it wrong. But if you don't act, you'll never know.